Hi, folks. Can you hear me? OK, tell me if you can. Um, my name is Judy Schwartz. And um, I am the clinical director of End of Life Choices New York. These are some of the things that we're going to talk about today, but I want to keep the focus on why you're all here, uh, because what we said we were going to talk about are ways that people in New York State can control the circumstances and timing of their own death, how they can, if they choose, hasten their own death. So we're going to talk about two ways to have that happen. But before I get there, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my organization because the reason I can talk to you about these options is because of the patients that call me and say, oh my God, can you help me? At least listen to my story, which I do. So it's concerns brought to us by terminally and incurably and progressively ill folks who want to have information and that's what we do. You may know that all suffering can't be effectively treated by medicine or interventions. And sometimes, despite the best of end-of-life care, hospice and palliative care, people want to know how they can legally hasten their own deaths. And in New York State, the only real legal option is to voluntarily stop eating and drinking. We call that V-SED, nobody's first choice but we're going to talk a lot about that in a while. The other thing we're going to talk about is a fairly new development that we have created at End of Life Choices New York, which is this dementia directive. Perhaps some of you have heard about it. It's a directive that allows a person with an early diagnosis of some form of dementia to decide about limiting hand feeding in the future at a time when they become severely impacted by their disease and they can't feed themselves anymore. So we're going to talk about that as the second way that people can actually hasten their own dying. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about the clinical issues and some of the ethical issues and my colleague, David Hoffman, is going to tell you a whole lot about the legality and the legal process in supporting these kinds of choices. So. End of Life Choices New York, right? I'm a nurse, and I think that's important to say up front. I am a nurse. And that's the lens through which I see all of the issues that are brought to me. Um, I've been doing this work for over 15 years with our current organization and the previous one that we worked with. We're a not-for-profit organization, and we provide clinical, accurate information about end-of-life options and choices. Um, and the fact that we are a not-for-profit means we're not charging for what we do. Uh, we respond to all who contact us, and we also work to improve care, expand choices at the end of life, and we really hope that aid in dying is legalized at some point in New York State. Um, it's important that you realize that we work very closely with hospice and palliative care clinicians. Um, my goal is always to help people understand the benefits that can be learned and had from hospice and to really try to get a timely enrollment to somebody who has a terminal diagnosis, which means that somebody's made a guesstimate that they're going to die in six months. So we really try to help people understand the benefits of hospice so that they are enrolled in home hospice care rather than the last three days of their disease but perhaps for the last three months, which is when hospice does the best work. For decisionally capable persons suffering from terminal and incurable progressive diseases who wish to hasten their deaths, as I said, the only legal option currently existing in New York State, in addition, of course, to stopping life-prolonging measures, right? If you're connected to something that's keeping you alive and you decide you want to stop that, you will die, uh, and that's perfectly legal. But that's a little bit different than what we're talking about. We're talking about people who don't have the option of saying, OK, I don't want that anymore. They're not dependent upon any life-prolonging interventions. So I think that, that when we talk to people about this option of voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, even when they don't choose to use that information, they are comforted by knowing that they have an option, that they have some choices, even though they may be terminally ill. They still have some choices. And that's very important to these folks whose disease have taken so much away from them. 
All right, that's not me, that's you. Let me welcome you. Uh, my name is David Hoffman. I'm a member of the faculty of the Columbia University Bioethics Master's and Certificate Program, and it's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, this is not a fun, easy topic, but it's a very important topic. And at Columbia, we're very committed to training the next generation of clinicians and clinical ethicists so that these conversations are easier to have in the future. Uh, so we have some flyers up at the front about our programs. Uh, we have a full-blown master's program if you're interested in advancing your education. We also operate a certificate program, which is a scaled-down training for anyone who wants to be more culturally literate about end-of-life issues and bioethics issues in general, and anyone who wants to be more confident in their presentation of information, whether it's in these kinds of forums that Judy and I do, or in institutional settings, or community center settings, or just with your families. Uh, so we're gonna have a very rich, dense conversation today. Um, Judy and I are gonna stick around afterwards because you're gonna have questions, and some of them you may feel comfortable asking in front of a group, Others of them you may want to ask privately. Um, but hold on to those questions, because that's an important part of the process, is just understanding what your personal concerns are. And that is, of course, why a university like Columbia exists. So on behalf of the university and our uh, master's in certificate program, welcome. <laughs> yes, um, the slides, by the way, will be available on both the Columbia Bioethics Program website and the End of Life Choices website afterwards so that you'll have access to all of the information. Some of it's there really specifically so that you have it as a reference afterwards. So I think it's always important to agree on what we're talking about, right? So let's be sure that we're all on the same page about what we mean by the concept of voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. In a very short definition, it's a manner of deliberately hastening death by deciding to stop consuming all oral food and fluids, even though you can still physically eat and drink. But you're choosing to not have any more food or fluid with the goal of hastening your own death. That's what you want to do. It's an intentional and voluntary choice. And by voluntary, I mean it's non-coerced. You're deciding you're going to do this based on the information you have about this option. So it's an intentional, voluntary choice by a decisionally capable person, and that's really important, um, who suffers intolerably from an incurable and progressive or terminal illness. And their goal in doing so is to hasten their own death. Um, Many people, if you've ever known somebody who was dying and in hospice care, they really don't have much of an appetite. And it's a natural process, part of the dying process, that people don't feel like eating much. But this is different. This is an intentional choice to stop with the goal of hastening death. As I keep saying, it's rarely anybody's first choice, I can tell you. But often it's the only legal option that's available. Um, so let me be sure. OK, here we go. So let's talk about what does it mean to have a <coughs> successful V said outcome, and by that I mean a death. I do talk about dying rather than passing over and those other things. I mean, that's what I do. Um, so voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is legally available. Listen to me, he's the lawyer, I'm telling you. It's legally available in all states if a person is decisionally capable and makes a voluntary, informed, and contemporaneous choice. In other words, they're making the choice right now, right? Um, a successful outcome, a successful death, is a peaceful death with a minimum of discomfort that occurs within a predictable period of time. And that period of time is days or weeks, depending upon their underlying disease and what else is going on with them. That's my definition of what a successful V-said outcome is. 
It's important to note that the cause of death is dehydration and not starvation. That's of some importance to family members because um, this can be hard. This is a hard thing for families to have to be there and watch. So over the years, and I've helped a lot of people and a lot of families through this choice, um, I've come to realize that there are four things that are necessary for a successful outcome, that, that successful outcome that I told you about before. Um, you have to have a decisionally capable person who's suffering and very, very determined to hasten their own death by fasting. This isn't something that somebody else can do for you. You have to do it yourself. And that, and that again, that can be hard. I mean, a lot of people are used to delegating things in life. This is nothing that you can delegate. If this is something that you feel you must do, you have to be determined to be successful in order to succeed. You also must understand the process. You must know what's involved. And we're talking about physiologically, how much time, what to expect, what's the suffering like? Is it terribly painful? No, it isn't. But you need to know what to expect, what your family will see, and how they can help. Um, you also have to have reached a point in your illness where you know for sure that the burdens of living consistently outweigh the benefits. I mean, this is not because you're having a bad hair day, right? This is a very conscious choice that you've made because living just is not anything that you can put up with anymore. So that's number one. Um, you must have social and caregiving support. And by that I mean you have to have friends or family or other loved ones who will journey along with you, who understand why you've made this choice and will help you and be present as you are going through the fasting period. Um, you also will need caregiving support because a loved one can't be with you 24-7 and you will need somebody there with you because pretty soon you're going to probably be too weak to get out of bed. You'll be in bed all the time and you'll need caregiving help to keep you clean and dry and comfortable in bed. Um, the other thing that you must have, number three, is access to hospice or palliative medical oversight. I get a lot of calls from people, often in upstate New York, often gentlemen who say, I don't want to involve anybody else. I'm going to take care of this myself like I've done everything else in my life. And I say, well, um, you could try that, but I think you're going to have some problems. And let me tell you a few things that you might haven't thought about, like if you're very, very weak and you get up and try to go to the bathroom by yourself, you could fall and break a hip which is true, and we sure don't want that. So you really do need to have help, you need to have people there with you, and you need to have physicians who will order medication that will keep you comfortable and in a sort of a sleepy state, ideally, throughout the process. And the last thing you need is patience. You need to be able to be patient with the process, and so does your family. So are there clinical challenges to a V-said death? You bet there are. For those who are terminally ill, forgoing food and fluid usually is not difficult because they really don't have a whole lot of appetite, as I've said. Forgoing fluids, on the other hand, can be very challenging, and particularly for some people who, who like to drink a lot, a lot of the time. It can be addressed, and it's not rocket science. It's just good, basic bedside nursing care from aides or family members who help you keep your mouth moist and the mucous membranes not feeling dry. And you can do that easily by rinsing and spitting and by fine sprays and those swabby things and, and hard candy or anything that keeps your mouth feeling moist. And that's what we want, because this shouldn't be any more uncomfortable than, than it appears to need or it appears to be. Um, as I said, small doses of opiates and anti-anxiety medications can help patients be sort of more sleepy and less conscious of the fact that they're not drinking. The usual fast, for some, the length of the fast for somebody who's terminally ill uh, is 7 to 14 days. The average is 10 days. Um, if fluids are limited, they really have to be limited because if you keep drinking even little bits, you, you prolong the dying process. But again, if that's your choice, that's what you do. Everybody gets to decide how they're going to do this. Patients often slip into a coma uh, during the final days of a fast. 
There are more challenges, clinical challenges, when a patient is not yet terminally ill. And these are the people who've been living with many comorbidities for a long time. They're usually confined to their apartment. Uh, they may have chronic uh, illnesses that have reached the, the, the end stage, but they're not quite terminal, so they're not eligible for hospice. And that's one of the big problems. How do we get them access to hospice and palliative care? Um, sometimes if the patient has a long-time primary care physician, that physician will assume the role of being a palliative care uh, clinician. And I mean, again, these medications are not complicated and I've helped a lot of physicians figure out what to order and what to have at the bedside for patients like this. Um, uh, sometimes what has to happen is the patient has to fast for several days. And then you can call up hospice and say, you know what, she's just given up, she's just not eating or drinking, and I need some help caring for her. And then usually hospice will step in at that point. In the absence of a terminal diagnosis, <coughs> the fasting can be a longer experience. It can last up to three weeks, which is really hard. So again, you have to have a great deal of determination to be successful at this. Um, it must be clear to all those who are coming into contact with a patient that their suffering is just so evident that everybody can see it and everybody wants to be able to help them get out of that situation. So are there ethical issues around supporting VSA? Uh, it's absolutely the case that some people believe that it's morally wrong for a person to hasten or cause their own death. They're, they're, they have strong beliefs about that. And they may also feel that to tell somebody about this option and provide them information involves them morally in what they feel is an unacceptable act. And so all healthcare clinicians have an absolute right to decide what they are morally comfortable providing to patients. Um, they can absolutely claim a conscience provision that allows them to withdraw from a case. However, what they can't do is abandon a patient. You may withdraw, but you must transfer the care of the patient to somebody else who will provide this legally, palliatively supported information to people who want it. So that's the issue there. Um, I was very pleased to see this. The American Nurses Association, which is not the most progressive of organizations, I must say, uh, finally decided in 2017 that they would revise their opposition to, in any way, helping patients to hasten their death. And they actually uh, published uh, uh, this statement that supports patients' rights to make an informed choice to stop eating and drinking in order to hasten death. They actually used those words, to hasten death, which is quite remarkable. It was a very big deal. Some of us worked rather hard to get them to see the light, I might add. Uh, and the AMA has not yet uh, decided what they're going to do about this. So I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. Unless you look good in blue. <laughs> so um, giving you a little bit of background in terms of the people who contact End of Life Choices New York, in the past, before the last couple of years, almost everybody had advanced cancer, right? They either had come out of remission and they now were in a terminal stage where the disease had spread widely in their bodies, or it was a newly diagnosed, really awful cancer that had already spread, and um, they really had no options except hospice and palliative care. Um, the other patients that we saw a lot of, that I saw a lot of, and I still do, are patients with advanced ALS, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease. Is that how you spell Gehrig? G-E-H-R-I-G. Thank you. Thank you. I, this did not look right to me. Um, but then in 2016, I began hearing from a new group of patients. And these were the folks with uh, an early diagnosis of dementia. Now, clearly, we're doing a whole lot better at, at diagnosing Alzheimer's early upstream. There's a lot more technical imaging uh, and testing that can be done, which is wonderful because, you know, the earlier people are diagnosed, the more research that can be done, the more we're going to learn about this disease, and it might actually get dealt with in a positive way. Um, <clears throat> however, many of the people that were diagnosed with a new, an early diagnosis of Alzheimer's 
had seen somebody in their family die badly from this disease, and they had really searing memories of those final months and sometimes years of that disease. And so they were desperate to know how they could avoid that final stage of this disease, or even before they had to get to that final stage of the disease. I want to give you a little, um, uh, this is the dementia data part. Um, it is astonishing. Six million Americans now have Alzheimer's, and that number is expected to rise to 14 million by 2050. Uh, advanced dementia, including Alzheimer's, is the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S. and the fifth leading cause for those who are over 65, and the third leading cause of death for those who are over 85. And although people can live quite well for several years with dementia, many want to avoid the final stages, the terminal stages. There are seven stages of declining abilities, both cognitive and physical. It's known as the FAST test, the Functional Assessment Staging Test. And this is the test that neurologists give to people who they're trying to figure out what's going on with them. They come in with their family members with memory problems and they want to know whether this was normal memory problems associated with aging or something else. So these are the stages. The first one to three stages are mild cognitive uh, impairment. Um, Increasing disorganization with, you know, grand planning and organizing your days and your, your weeks and your months. Memory challenges, but they are getting worse and they're increasing. By stages four and five, which is moderate dementia, moderate decline, they can't manage their own finances anymore and complex tasks become almost impossible. They can't choose appropriate <coughs> clothing for either a season or an occasion. By stage six, that's early advanced dementia, um, they're beginning to have some very severe symptoms. They're unable to dress or bathe, and the mechanics of, to of toileting are simply beyond them. They are beginning to be incontinent of stool and urine, and sometimes this is the stage when family members feel that they just can't manage this person at home anymore because there can, be, there can be psychological changes as well, which can be really difficult to deal with. Stage seven is the terminal advanced stage of dementia. It includes uh, loss of speech. You go from having short sentences to actually maybe one or two words at most. Uh, they're unable to recognize loved ones and they can't ambulate or sit up without assistance. They certainly can't feed themselves and they can't smile. What a sad thing. This terminal stage can last for months or years if the patient is hand fed. All right, moving from that sort of depressing stuff to um, factoids, a few more factoids, which I knew nothing about. 10% of people, of all people 65 and older, have Alzheimer's or some other demanding disease. Older African Americans are twice as likely to have Alzheimer's as older white people. Older Hispanics are one and a half times as likely to have Alzheimer's disease as older whites. And two thirds of Americans living with Alzheimer's disease are women. Why is that? We live longer, right? Um, as the number of elderly Americans increasing, s increases, so does the number of those with Alzheimer's. It's directly related. Um, because of early, er, there's increasing early diagnosis because of the development of biomarkers for disease, as I said. Um, so I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to begin to talk to you about how we developed this dementia directive, how it came about. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, and then David is going to tell you a whole lot about important legal stuff that you need to know. So. Part of how I came to think about this was influenced by two very, very powerful cases on the West Coast, one in Canada and one in Oregon. And then really smart scholars, legal and philosophical scholars, started writing about, thinking about, and then I guess they thought first and then they wrote, about uh, advanced directives addressing the issue of hand feeding. I'd never really thought about it, actually. Um, and, and first steps were taken by our sister organization, End of Life Washington. And then I'll tell you about some of the difficult cases we had. But now David is going to tell you a lot that is really important for you to know about the legal perspective. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. Thank you, 
deep breath because this is stressful, right? It's good to deal with this stress now. It will make it easier to deal with other stresses later. So this is a worthwhile investment. So the first question we typically get asked when Judy and I do these talks uh, for the public is, well, this notion of an advanced directive for people with dementia, is that legal? And the answer is we don't know yet. Because the only way to find out is for someone to assert the right, the legal right, putting aside the moral right. Somebody needs to assert the legal right to have a surrogate, somebody acting on their behalf, insist that they not be spoon-fed when they reach that stage seven, or even the late part of stage seven of the FAST scale, and to have a judge look at this and decide whether this is a right that the law has an obligation to enforce. The closest I can get to answering the question, is this legal, is to look at what kind of similar situations have arisen in the past where the courts have weighed in and where the courts have weighed in and said something that was not popularly supported, what the legislature has done to change the rules that the court had identified in a particular case. Of course, when the legislature does that, that applies to everyone. Now, it is usual and customary in an academic setting for speakers to disclose their conflicts of interest. Um, during a lecture such as this, and uh, I have no financial conflicts of interest. And I don't know that what I'm about to describe is a conflict of interest, but it's an interest that I have that you ought to be aware of. So in addition to being a member of the faculty of the bioethics program here at Columbia, and being a clinical ethicist who consults with patients, and being a healthcare lawyer who consults with patients and clinicians, I am the son of someone who has Alzheimer's disease. So my mom has uh, had about four and a half, five years, depending on when you chart the starting point of her Alzheimer's diagnosis, and she's sort of at the early stage of level six, and that affects my view of what interpretation ought to be applied to the law to recognize the right of patients to make decisions for themselves, including making decisions ahead of time about what they want done for themselves when they can't make decisions for themselves at all, what we call in law and in ethics the loss of decision-making capacity. Now, you hear people refer to capacity and competence. I don't like the notion of competence. It seems so black and white, yes, no, on, off. When we talk about decision-making capacity, we're talking about the ability of an individual to make a particular decision. And you can have an illness state that makes it impossible for you to make some decisions, technically complicated decisions, but be perfectly capable of making other decisions, such as the decision, who do you want to make decisions for you, the ones that you can't make for yourself. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about how we got to a point where we're even having a discussion about patients voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, meaning making that decision at the moment that they stop and people who make a personal decision ahead of time that they don't want to stop eating and drinking now, but when they get to a certain point, that level seven on the fast scale, that they want their surrogate, their healthcare proxy or agent, to enforce their decision not to be force-fed. Now, the term force-fed is itself a little loaded. Some people object to the term force-fed. Some people would rather use the word hand-fed or spoon-fed. Whatever. 
It's the notion that even when you lose the ability to articulate your choices and values, that you have both a legal and a moral right to delegate that activity, that function, to someone who will carry out your wishes when you are no longer able to carry out those wishes yourself. So when we think about this notion of patients having the right to make decisions for themselves, you have to think back pretty far. 1914 is when we shifted our thinking about medicine from the notion that the doctor knows best and doctors decide what is and is not necessary and what is and is not appropriate and what will and will not be done. So 1914, that's what a car looked like in 1914, just to put this in some context, right? Benjamin Cardozo, smart guy, has a law school named after himself down on Fifth Avenue and 12th Street. I happen to teach there. And he was handed a case. This is what happens with judges. Cases just show up in your court. This happened to be the New York State Court of Appeals, our highest court. This was before he went to the Supreme Court. So he was just a state court judge. And he had to decide the case of Mary Schloendorf versus the Society of New York Hospital. And he articulated this standard, which all of my students have to be able to repeat by heart before they finish the program, because it's that important. Every person of adult years and sound mind has the right to control what is done to their body. And it goes on from there. But that's the gist of it. It actually says his own body. It was 1914. So this is the first articulation in the law of a standard of the right to consent to what's done to you and conversely, obviously, the right to withhold consent. Everything we are going to talk about in terms of the legal analysis of the issues that Judy outlined flow from these words of Benjamin Cardozo's in 1914. So fast forward to 1987, which to some people it was a long time ago. To me, that was the year I started practicing law. So not that long ago. And this court decision, we're not going to get into the details and you don't have to study the citation. The story is what's important. In Delio versus Westchester County Medical Center, a gentleman um, had a surgical mishap and something bad happened and he wound up practically brain dead. Not quite. And after a prolonged period of treatment, his wife, Julie Delio, now Julie Chase, said to the hospital, enough. It's time to stop his artificial feeding. They had him on feeding tubes, because that's what you do with someone who's in a minimally conscious state teetering on brain death. And the hospital said, no, we can't do that. That's wrong. Your husband is our patient. We have an obligation to treat him. We're going to treat him. So uh, Julie went to court, and it ultimately wound up in the appellate division, which is our middle-level court. And to make a long story short, that court said to Westchester County Medical Center, no, you're wrong. If Ms. Delio is telling you that her husband would not want to be treated this way, Schloendorf says a patient has the right to make decisions about what is done with their body. And the court in Delio said that 
expression of preference, that expression of values can be delivered, can be articulated by a surrogate, in this case, his wife. So they followed the order of the court, artificial nutrition and hydration was withdrawn, and Mr. Delio died. The next year, it's not easy being Westchester County Medical Center. <laughs> Mary O'Connor shows up in court because Westchester County Medical Center said, oh, well, we got burned last year. We're not going to say no to the patient because that seems cruel, but we don't want to just go ahead and do this on our own and say it's okay to withdraw artificial nutrition and hydration. In this case, we'll go to court. We'll tell the court that we were here last year and we want to make sure we're doing what's right and we'll bear the expense and the obligation of going through the legal process and then the court will say Delio versus Westchester, it's the patient's right, a surrogate can express that right and we'll be able to do what the patient wants and, and we'll be the good guys. Did I mention it's not easy to be Westchester County Medical Center? So in that year there was some change in thinking about these subjects. Maybe because word got out about Delio, maybe not. But this case went all the way to the New York State Court of Appeals, that highest court that Benjamin Cardozo sat on. And they said, oh no, that court last year, they were wrong. You cannot withhold artificial nutrition and hydration in New York State unless there is clear and convincing evidence that that is what the patient said ahead of time they wanted done. And that created this O'Connor standard, the clear and convincing evidence standard, which we lived with for decades. And it made New York one of only two states in the nation that did not permit family members to make these most important medical decisions on behalf of their loved ones. New York and Missouri. Spend an entire semester talking about Missouri and the Cruzan decision, but not tonight. So the O'Connor case caused a lot of consternation. And not long after that case was decided, groups of people in the bioethics community got themselves organized and went up to Albany to educate the legislature about how damaging the O'Connor decision was to the ethical practice of medicine and the management of end-of-life care. And that gave us the New York State Healthcare Proxy Law, Section 2982 of the Public Health Law, which took us out of the unhappy company of Missouri and created a legal right of a patient to appoint someone, something you had to do when you had decision-making capacity, but it was a start. It didn't get us into the company of most other states where even if you hadn't appointed someone, a family member could act on your behalf even without having been previously appointed. We have the problem of only about 10% of people have actually gone, followed through with filling out a healthcare proxy form. That's a shame, another discussion for another day. Uh, but we had the ability for people to designate healthcare agents to give that instruction to their surrogate, their healthcare proxy, healthcare agent, pick your term. And, and that got us a little bit of the way to where we needed to be. And at the time, the New York State Task Force on Life and Law and the Health Department put out this um, guidebook for healthcare professionals in January of 1991, uh, which is still available on the Department of Health website and is a really interesting read for historical purposes and to give a hint as to where we're going with the non-artificial 
administration of nutrition and hydration. That's spoon feeding that Judy was talking about a few minutes ago. So here's some of the guidance. Must evidence of the patient's wishes about artificial nutrition and hydration be written on the proxy form? No. It just has to be clear that the patient had communicated their wishes to their surrogate and then that surrogate could act on those wishes. What if the agent's decision appears to conflict with written instructions by the patient on the proxy form or elsewhere? The patient's express wishes, the law says, control. So if your agent is not doing their job of carrying out your wishes, that agent has forfeited their authority. That can require going to court to get that conflict sorted out, but that's what the law said. So why is this such a problem even today? And the reason is because of some federal regulations that have to do with the disciplinary standards that the federal government, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Serv Services, CMS, yeah, it should be CMMS, but whatever. Um, the federal government created standards for what is expected of facilities that take care of people who are elderly and incapacitated, including patients at the end of their life. And the reason that most adult care facilities, independent living, assisted living, nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, all of them, a large part of the reason that they are so reluctant to respect a patient's wishes expressed either through the patient's own words or through a surrogate is that they are afraid that they are going to be accused of patient neglect or abuse or abandonment. And they're worried about going to jail because some of these infractions in other situations, such as when a facility lets a patient wander out in the middle of the winter and the patient freezes to death. That has given rise to prosecution. And so that's the fear, that's the apprehension that we're up against. So the Federal Register of Regulations rather actually define abuse, neglect, immediate jeopardy, so that Operators of facilities who are charged with the custodial care of people who are not fully capable of taking care of themselves know what is expected of them. And then the government went a step further and created these guidances about what the standards are that will be applied when a patient when a, when a patient care facility is inspected by the government to determine whether that facility is adhering to those regulations. So this is the standard for failure to provide adequate nutrition and hydration to support and maintain health. We're going to go through this in detail in a moment. It lies, by the way, in the manual, in the handbook, between failure to protect patients from undue adverse medication cons consequences, medication errors, and failure to protect from widespread nosocomial infections, institution-acquired infections. So that's where this eating and drinking comes into the, the sort of scheme of regulation of these adult care facilities. So here's what E says in more readable print. Failure to provide adequate nutrition and hydration to support and maintain health. That's the standard. That's what you can be sanctioned for. And the specifications are food supply inadequate to meet the nutritional needs of the individual, meaning you're not competently running your facility if you don't have food around, right? Because if you don't have food around, you can't be feeding people. Number three, withholding nutrition and hydration without advanced directive. That's in bold and underlined, that's my doing. Although that ought to be the way the regulation is published. And between those two is failure to provide adequate nutrition and hydration resulting in malnutrition. So it's 
Number two, the failure to provide. And number three, the active step of withholding. Seems like they're almost the same thing, right? But in the law, they're not. Because one is a failure to make an affirmative effort. And the law is very clear that you always have to make the affirmative effort to offer food to anyone who's in your care. But on the subject of withholding nutrition and hydration, such as in accordance with a patient's wishes, that's only a problem if it's other than pursuant to a patient's advanced directive. So that should be the end of the discussion, right? But it's not. So they give illustrations in the manual so that the inspectors know what they should be looking for. And this is important to understand because this is what we're up against, right? Example number two, during the investigation, the surveyor finds that the chart does not include a copy of the patient's advanced directive. The progress note does not contain any documentation of the patient ever having stated a wish to have nutrition and hydration withdrawn at the end of life. The patient has a diagnosis of advanced dementia with a documented history of refusal to eat in a long-term care facility. The patient has been admitted because of continued weight loss and dehydration related to the refusal to eat and drink. That's the only illustration offered in the manual. They ignore the all-important counterpoint. If the patient does have an advanced directive and has made it clear that they don't want to be fed when they reach fast level number seven, by simple logic, the counterpoint to this scenario is you respect a patient's wishes. This is the proposition that we need to enforce and test legally. And that's why Judy and I do these talks and why we advocate for patients who want to assert their right to refuse any care, medical care and non-medical care. So, this still comes up in court. This is the Bornstein case, which was in 2005. And to make a very long, very sad story short and to the point, in this case, the daughter of the patient, who was the appointed health care agent, made the decision, enough artificial feeding for my mother, and the patient's sister, the agent's aunt, objected and took this to court. And the court said, well, you are clearly daughter, the appointed agent, and you can make all of the decisions that need to be made for your mother except about artificial nutrition and hydration. And why did they say that? Because when the patient filled out her healthcare proxy form, the advanced directive form, she didn't specifically say, my agent knows my wishes about artificial nutrition and hydration and is authorized to make those decisions. Now that requirement has been in the law. And shame on anyone who advised this patient and her daughter in how to fill out the healthcare proxy form because you need to be very specific. Question? Yeah, I'm not sure if I missed this. I just wanted to clarify, and maybe you're getting to this. You were, the, when we were looking at the, um, the standard, the manual for what you were talking about um, inpatient care and in facility, yep. mm -hmm. um, are you going to talk about the relationship between those standards and hospice having reticence about, or whether those standards are applied to Right, we're going to get to that. Okay. The short answer to your question is where spoon feeding or oral feeding or force feeding, pick your adjective, um, is concerned, these same obstacles present themselves. 
simply because of the reluctance of organizations, whether they're inpatient hospice or home hospice services, the reluctance to assume that responsibility. Everyone wants somebody else to be the test case and establish this as a legal right. Because they would legally be required to report abuse. Wait, 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 well, wait, 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 wait. Okay. I hate it when he starts talking clinical stuff. <laughs> we will talk about this. Okay. Uh, because this is the clinical reality. This may be what the law says, but let me tell you what happens in, in the real world. No, I understand that, but I also wanted to know if the law had been tested to more... Okay. That's Hosp why we're here. Yeah, and hospice is, tends to be very, very happy when they have a completed document that says this now unable to talk to us person previously decided here's how they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. They're fine with that. And the regulations that we reviewed a few minutes ago couldn't be more clear that if the patient has left an advanced directive, that means that respecting that patient's wishes, because Cardozo said so in the Schloendorf case, ought to yield no accusation of neglect or abuse or harm, right? But that's the hill we have to get over. So. Bornstein is the example of the court actually enforcing the law as written. It's a shame that it was written that way. There's no particularly valid ethical reason why a decision about nutrition and hydration should be subject to a different standard than all of the other treatment decisions that a surrogate can make. But that's what came out of the legislative process. We can have a whole discussion about that some other time. It's where we are today. So it was the issue of the peg tube and the sister wanting the daughter removed as a healthcare agent that got this to court. And what's important for us about Bornstein is the court said, look, just because the surrogate, the daughter, took a different view than the sister and didn't comply with the technical requirements of the law, that's no reason to remove the daughter as the healthcare agent because the sister was seeking to have herself substituted and the court said no. We're going to respect the instruction of the patient when the patient had decisional capacity except on this one technical point because their paperwork wasn't right. So they followed, uh, following the, the daughter's withdrawal of objection to the insertion of the peg tube, because she was told that she was going to lose that argument, she was allowed to remain as her mother's healthcare agent. And, and not surprisingly, in time, the patient passed. So where do we go from here? What do we have to do to take these legal lessons from artificial tube feeding, nutrition, hydration, and move it into the discussion about how patients ought to be allowed to refuse oral hand feeding, either under the VSED standard because they decide at that moment, or through a use of the uh, dementia directive that Judy was talking about, what we need to do is make sure that everyone is well informed about what your advanced directive has to say and what your agent, your proxy, has to know to assert. And that, of course, is why Judy and I do this all the time, to spread that word. So you need to appoint an agent. You need to have a healthcare proxy. It would be advisable to have what's called a durable power of attorney for care decisions and the dementia advance directive. Because we don't know what legal objections someone is going to raise when one of these cases finally gets to court, something that we hope happens sooner rather than later. And then, most importantly, You've got to leave behind instructions for your agent, in addition to hitting all those legal points, you need to leave behind instructions that describe what your values are. 
not if I have this, then I want that, and if I don't have this, then I do want that, because that can get complicated and often doesn't work. What you need to describe is your values and what is important to you in the way you live your life and the way you're treated at the end of your life. So here's my advanced directive. It's not right for everyone, but it's an example of just how simple this can be, right? It's six lines. It starts out with a little prose. I do not want to be a potted plant. If I am unable to express myself and show signs of experiencing joy, that's that smile that Judy talked about earlier, I want all but pain care withheld so that my passing can come quickly. Note, I didn't say all but pain medical care withheld, care in general for a particular purpose so that my passing can come quickly. Organs to the living, body to science, then to the sea. Smile and breathe is just my instructions to my wife and my son who are my healthcare agents to keep this all in perspective. So you don't, you don't say specifically, you don't have to say specifically here, withhold, you know, food through a feeding tube. You would be in real trouble if he had dementia. Yeah, you don't have to say that in this. I'm sorry. I don't have the ability to remind people. Yeah. So let me repeat the question, absolutely. Um, I don't have to say here what I want specifically done about nutrition and hydration because that's in the healthcare proxy document, right? This is what I talked about a moment ago about leaving behind clear written instructions of your values and preferences. Those other documents we talked about are the technical authority and they're all important. And this is why it's really important that you are all here tonight. It's really important that you talk to your friends and family about this. And it's really important that you know that you can call End of Life Choices New York to get specific personal guidance on how to put this all together, right? It would be nice if there were one simple form and we could put it on the back of a book of matches, um, but we don't live in that world yet. We may get there soon. So why does this matter? Because if you have not prepared yourself well in the current risk-averse, risk management environment in which many people find themselves when they suffer from advanced dementia, you can wind up in a very, very unfortunate clinical circumstance. And so now Judy is going to describe two of them. She hinted at them earlier, um, they are difficult, difficult cases to discuss, but really important that we illustrate for you what is at stake here. Question? Mm -hmm. Your directives, do they have to be notarized? No. Under New York law, the question is, does a directive have to be notarized? Under New York law, your advanced directive has to be witnessed by two individuals. It's all very carefully laid out in the instructions that come with the form. If you decide to go the uh, durable power of attorney route, which is another level of legal protection and direction that you can live, leave, uh, that needs to be notarized. Um, but you can accomplish all of this with a healthcare proxy form and the dementia directive because what we're trying to set up is the circumstance where if somebody says, oh, we can't follow your wishes because feeding isn't medical care, okay, then we have another document that specifically addresses non-medical care, right? And we're just trying to prepare for the legal arguments that we anticipate will be made in opposition to recognizing and enforcing this patient's right. We can. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to leave anyone lost, but yeah, if you can hold your questions, um, can we'll you write we'll the question down? we'll stick around. Because I won't remember the place in which 
Okay. Well, I just want to throw the question out there, and and we'll foot we'll footnote it. Just what's the question? For your witness, can the person that you appoint as an agent be a witness as well? The answer is no. Your witnesses cannot be your agent. And if you have an issue with finding people to do all of that, call End of Life Choices New York. We can get you help. All right. So I'm going to turn it back over to Judy, um, and and. Take another deep breath. <laughs> All right. I have to go back over here. So um, I am going to tell you how we came about creating this dementia directive, which I might add is the first in the nation, really, this kind of comprehensive uh, dementia directive. Um, we're pretty proud of it. Oh. oh. He's not done yet. The answer to the question, why does this matter, is because like your teeth, if you ignore your rights, they will go away. Sorry, I added that last night. He also works as a dentist on the weekends. <laughs> um, so uh, anyhow, so, so this was the first landmark case that had never been decided before. It, w it occurred in Vancouver, British Columbia. Margot Bentley uh, was a nurse. She had done a lot of private duty nursing uh, in her day. She'd seen a lot of people die badly. And she knew how she did not want to die. When she retired, she traveled the world. She was a free spirit. She had many companions that she traveled with. And she kept revising her living will, and she'd send it back to her daughters in Vancouver. OK, no, this is the final one. I'm, th I'm really clear. This is definitely what I want now. Don't, don't. And of course, each time you write a new directive, it, it cancels out the previous one. Um, so she wrote in her final document that she, was she wanted to refuse nourishment and liquids if suffering from extreme mental disability. And then she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and she did have to come home. She was in a, a nursing home, a residential nursing home. And for a while, she was OK, and she seemed to enjoy being there, and she could recognize her family, and she enjoyed their visits. And then her disease, as it does, inexorably worsened. And it got to the point that the, that the daughters felt that she was now at the point that she would not want to be fed any, any longer. And I, let me just say, following up on this healthcare proxy thing, a lot of people think if they, if they hit that box that says, no artificial nutrition and hydration, I'm good to go. Right? I've taken care of, I'm not going to have a prolonged dying, not with dementia. Because some aid will stand there patiently and feed you. So anyhow, um, so there she was in the nursing home. She was being fed. And the daughters concluded that now it was time to bring out this final directive, show it to the administrators and the staff in this nursing home. And they agreed. Clearly, this was appropriate. This was a clearly written directive saying she did not want nourishment and liquids if she was in an extreme mental disability. Clearly, that was where she was. They were arranging to transfer her home on hospice. And making those arrangements took a little while. And during that interval, the ownership of the nursing home changed hands. The new administrator said, ah, not so fast. No, 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 no. We have a duty to feed. I don't care what that document says. We will continue to feed your mother so long as her mouth opens which is a position that many nursing home administrators take. And so the family fought this in court for years. They kept going to judges, begging, pleading, talking about how their mother would not want to be kept alive. In one situation, they videotaped uh, Margot being fed by the aides with the spoon like that. And finally, she would open her mouth. And the aide said, see, she likes chocolate. That's why she's opening her mouth. The judge looked at this and said, oh, she's changed her mind. She wants to eat. She's opening her mouth. She's cooperating and eating. And that's the kind of mentality that, you know, these are not clinical people, these the judges. So um, finally, she died at age 83. I have a very grueling picture. I'm going to just show you very quickly. You don't have to look at it. You can close your eyes if you want to. This was Margot Bentley in the last months of her life. So the second case uh, is from Oregon. Uh, that woman was Nora Harris. And as a fairly young woman at age 56, she was diagnosed with early stage and aggressive dementia, which meant 
that the slope to death was going to be much steeper. She completed an advanced directive after she had been diagnosed and knew that she had Alzheimer's. And she wrote in her directive that she wanted to prevent her life from being prolonged when the disease got worse. So her husband of 30 years got to the point where he felt that his wife's quality of life was inadequate. He asked the administrators to please stop feeding her showed them the advance directive, and they said, we have a duty to feed so long as she opens her mouth, went to judges twice, kept going back, and this was a woman who was a research librarian. She was a Virginia Woolf scholar. Everybody that knew her said that she would hate living like this. The judge said, I'm really sorry, but there is no information about her wishes about being hand-fed in this directive. And he was sympathetic to the husband, who clearly loved his wife. But he said, there's nothing I can do here. So these were two very critical cases. She died at age 64, if you can believe it. And here's a picture of Nora. You can see she looks sort of worried and distracted. And those who loved her said she was worried and anxious all the time. She couldn't speak. She didn't recognize anybody. She couldn't make any comprehensible language. And this was the way she spent her final years. So, as I said, um, the folks that call us uh, at our call-in number that I think is somewhere there. Is it somewhere there, Ayana? Do we have our call-in number somewhere? Yes, there's a peak counseling service. Okay, good. There. So you'll find it. Um, most of those folks had, you know, advanced cancer or ALS. But then recently it began to change. In the last year or so, I get calls from patients and family members. Often the family member would be the wife of the husband with the Alzheimer's who would call and say, can you, can you talk to us? Can you meet us? Can you, can you see if there's anything we can do? And as I said, some of them had horrible memories of horrible deaths, and they were just so desperate to avoid that for themselves. Um, some of them, when they called, it was already too late, and this was one of those cases. Um, Hannah called me. She called me on the phone, and she said, can you help me help my mother to die? This is just so awful. I don't know what to do. And we stood at the foot of her mother's bed in her apartment in New York City. And the, her, she turned to me and she said, what did I do wrong? Because before the Alzheimer's diagnosis, she had met the mother and, and uh, the daughter, had met with a family attorney to complete an advance directive. And Hannah told that lawyer and her daughter in no uncertain term what she didn't want, what she wouldn't accept, what she couldn't tolerate, and the idea of tube feedings, god awful, horrible. The other thing she said is, do not waste my money. She had worked hard all of her life, and she didn't want to waste money on care that she didn't want. But again, nobody thought about dementia. Nobody thought about hand feeding. This was 25 years ago. People st still don't think about it. Hannah is now 99 years old. Uh, 16 years earlier, she had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or some other dementia. Uh, she's been in diapers for nine years in a hospital bed in her living room. She no longer speaks or moves purposely or doesn't appear to recognize her daughter, her only child, and her longtime caregivers. She's fed, fed spoon-fed three times a day by exceedingly patient nurses who, aides, who use endearments and encouragement and, and are quite prepared to stand there for an hour and a half, which is what each meal seems to take. When they bring a spoon to the corner of her mouth, it opens reflexively, like a baby bird's, right? Because that reflex remains long after there's any cognitive willfulness involved. Um, hospice deemed her terminal over two years ago, expecting her to die within six months. Hospice says she must continue to be spoon-fed until she forgets how to swallow. And that will happen eventually, I guess although it's not like any dementia, not like any Alzheimer's I've ever seen. Hospice can't predict, of course, when that will happen. So on the West Coast, um, End of Life Washington developed something they called Instructions for Oral Feeding and Drinking. And in that one-page form, uh, it stated that when dementia is advanced, they didn't define what that meant, oral feeding was to be limited to comfort-focused feeding. And they defined that as assisted feeding provided only while the patient seems to enjoy the food being fed 
and is willing to parti willingly participates in being fed. It was received with a whole lot of enthusiasm in Washington State. They went flying out the door, apparently. So we took that form and we thought, well, this is a nice start. But we in New York thought we could and we should go further than that. And again, it was based on the needs and the requests of the patients and families who called us. Some of those folks who called, particularly the men, wanted more options than limiting oral feeding when they became really advanced, advanced stages of dementia. They wanted to do something right now as soon as they had this diagnosis. And of course, they could stop eating and drinking. It's a legal option. You don't have to be terminally ill to make a choice to hasten your own death by stopping eating and drinking. But let me tell you, absent a terminal diagnosis, it's very hard to do that, particularly when you're beginning to lose your cognitive ability to make a plan and stick with it. And that kind of cognitive deterioration is subtle. And when it happens over time, you don't even realize that it's happened. I've yet to have anybody make that, to cho make that choice. Um, so, as I say. And let me just note that we're talking about this subset of patients who don't have a life support intervention to discontinue. That's right. Lots of people, when they get to this stage, are either dependent on a ventilator or vasopressor drugs or dialysis or some other medical intervention that they have an absolute legal right yeah to refuse either directly or through their healthcare agent, and that will bring about their death. These folks aren't so lucky. Um, and that's why we developed this dementia directive. Um, it has two purposes. The first is to document the patient's wishes about limiting assisted oral feeding when dementia becomes advanced. And the second purpose is to ensure that the appointed healthcare agent is empowered to implement those choices when, when the patient suffers from advanced dementia. It's important to note it doesn't replace, as David said, other advanced directives. They're still important to complete, but it augments those other directives. It provides further instruction about a very specific situation under very specific circumstances. Um, it has instructions about when to begin limiting oral intake, because that's very important, right? Because that's the first question that clinicians are going to want to know about. So this next slide talks about just when, what are the clinical criteria that would say, OK, now it's time to take out this dementia directive and say, OK, the time has come. There are three triggering clinical criteria for this dementia directive to be implemented. The first is the healthcare agent, the appointed healthcare agent, the proxy, consults with a primary care physician who knows the patient well. And they agree together that the patient is now in an advanced stage of dementia. This could be the end stage of, of six or any stage in seven, any part of stage seven. Um, as I said, it includes the inability to speak comprehensively, to ambulate, to recognize family, or to be continent. So that's the first requirement. The patient's in an advanced stage of dementia that's clinically clear. The second is the patient is unable to make healthcare decisions, right? They can't make a contemporaneous choice. And the third is they can't feed themselves. Somebody else has to feed them if they're going to stay alive. So those are the three criteria that have to be met before these instructions are implemented. So there are two options <coughs> in our directive about limiting assisted oral feeding. The first one is option A, which refuses all life prolonging measures, including cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and all nutrition and hydration, whether provided artificially medically through tube feedings or by assisted hand feeding. So it's refusing all of that stuff. And specifically, it's written into this directive that the patient refuses oral feedings even if their mouth opens when a spoon is brought there. So that's, they haven't changed their mind. Ignore that. We understand that'll happen. Ignore that. I don't want to be fed. 
It requests the provision of excellent comfort care, hospice and palliative interventions, once all oral intake, all life prolonging measures are stopped. So that's option A. The second, second option, option B, refuses all life prolonging measures including cardiopulmonary resuscitation and it refuses medically provided feedings, so that would be refusing all tube feedings, right? But it says, I will limit, I want you to limit my oral hand feeding to comfort focused feeding and then it defines what that means quite specifically. So feedings are provided only while the patient shows enjoyment or positive anticipation in, in eating. Now this is clearly a subjective thing, right? People are going to be standing there and making a subjective judgment. Does this person seem to be enjoying this? Are they looking forward to eating? Do you have to kind of fight with them to get them to eat? What's going on here? And I think that that's a judgment that those who are caring for somebody over time can easily make. Um, they're only given food and fluid that they seem to enjoy. We don't care about balancing the green glop with the brown glop. It's whatever they like. If it's chocolate pudding, it's vanilla ice cream. If it's rice pudding, God forbid. Whatever they want, that's what they get to have. And that's what you give them. Feedings are stopped once the patient no longer appears interested. And that does happen. They're just completely disinterested. They're not tracking. They don't care. They're, they're asleep. They can't, you can't wake them up. Or if the patient begins to cough and choke, clearly they're now at a stage that they don't know what to do with that stuff that's put in their mouth. The patient is not to be coerced or cajoled or endeared into eating. It's offered, not by reflexively hitting their mouth, but offered. And if they don't want it, they don't get fed. Once the feeding is stopped again, access to comfort measures and medication with palliative or hospice care are provided. Now, this next slide is very important because these are all the additional instructions that are included in, there's six pages in this directive. Um, once a patient with an early diagnosis of dementia has decided that they want to complete this, that they have chosen which option that they want, they've got the witnesses, two witnesses, that's all, two witnesses. And they sh the witnesses for this directive ought to be people that know the patient well. We think that's important. Because a physician who doesn't know the patient well may want to talk to those witnesses. Did, did, you, did you see them signing this? Did they seem to actually understand what they were doing? To the, could they tell you why they were making this choice? We think that's important. Um, so you complete this directive, and what do you do with it? Well, it's not one and done. You discuss it with everybody, with your primary care physician, with your, your attorney, with your family, with your friends, anybody who cares about you. You want them to have a copy of this directive. You want them to understand <coughs> why you completed it, what your values are, why it's important to you. And you're asking them to honor this when you can't speak for yourself. You give, my, yeah. My family, we discussed it at Thanksgiving, an annual ritual. It gives everyone a reason, oh, this is when we talk about it, right? Like you change the batteries on your smoke detector, either on your birthday or New Year's. It should become a routine practice. That's what's important. Over the, over the drumsticks. Um, the other thing that I think people should do is make a videotape. When they complete this directive, while they're st decisionally capable, and in that little video, to, you know, like an iPhone thing. You just push the record thing. Um, and, you, and you tell whoever is out there who you are, why you've completed this directive, why it's important to you, why you want your wishes honored, why, it's Im why your values are what should be trumping the decision. I'll tell you why this is so desperately important. If that person ends up in a nursing home and there are aides caring for this person, and they have no idea who this body in the bed is because they're just, you know, taking care of this body in the bed. To have a videotape that shows an alive and vibrant person who is speaking directly to them and explaining why they don't want to be fed now, I think will go a huge long way in helping AIDS to provide this kind of care, which is really important. Have you put it on your Facebook page? Have I put what on my, what you mean, this videotape? Why not? Absolutely. That's a good idea. The important point here is that judges, as we saw from the handful of cases that I reviewed, are always looking for a reason to say 
no, I'm not going to let this happen. But when a judge, contrary to some people's belief, judges are human beings, they have families, they go home at the end of the day. When a judge can look at a patient when the patient had decisional capacity and that patient is talking to them, very, very persuasive. Yep. So um, these are the long-term care considerations that maybe you don't even have to worry about because David's handled it all. Um, we do know that oftentimes as dementia becomes advanced, patients, families just can't manage them at home and long-term care placement is necessary. I say in anticipation of those transfers, before, while that patient can still be a part of a decision-making process, go around to various different long-term care facilities or assisted living facilities with your completed dementia directive and ask the administrators of that place before you hand them your thousands of dollars and sign a contract, will they honor this directive yes. when you move in? I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And in time, we are, you're going to be part of a groundswell, I hope. We're going to try to change the way people think about these things from the ground up. And the way it happens is people start talking about this and they complete these directives and they show them to other people. Clearly we need to do a lot of education. We need to do education, in-service education in long-term care facilities. The, these poor aides that are doing, you know, the yeoman's work and caring for people, nobody tells them about any of this stuff and they really need to be included in these decision makings. We do anticipate judicial review, but I don't worry about it because David will take care of that. Um, we don't know when we're going to be able to determine whether it's successful. Uh, it may be some time, <laughs> we think. Um, we've counseled quite a number, I would say hundreds of people about this directive. And um, I'm hoping actually to begin to do some follow-up on folks that have completed a directive. Because I want to know what it was like for them. You know, what did their families say? What kind of pushback did they get from their mm -hmm. physicians? Did they get any? Were they excited about it? I'm telling you, every hospice and palliative care physician that I've spoken to about this directive, they're so grateful to have it. It's information that they need, that they want to have, in order to take better care of their patients who can't speak to them right now. Um, OK, so I think we're almost finished. In summary, this directive was created in response to pleas from patients, citizens, New York State citizens who've been newly diagnosed with dementia. And we were guided in how we created this by the previous work of others, the landmark decisions, the writings of really smart people. And our goal is to have it widely distributed and used by those who are wishing control over the length of the dementia-related dying process. Something else I've come to realize as I've, there's one family, I see them once a year. They come with all of their family with a completed directive and we talk about, you know, it's not over drumsticks, but it's the same sort of thing. How are you feeling about this now? Have you, have you had any more thoughts about it? How are the girls feeling who don't live in, the daughters who live in outside of this city? They all want copies of it. They want to be able to read it. They want to be able to ask questions about it. And I think that this is a very important part of the process because this gentleman has said, I never want to be in a nursing home. I want to stay at home, and I don't want you to give me any food or fluid. Even if I ask for it, don't you give me any. And I'm thinking, this is going to be very hard for his family, right? This is very hard. So what I try to do in our counseling sessions is get him to understand that this could be a hard choice for his family. And there might be ways that we can make it easier for them or help them to, to honor his wishes and at the same time respect the difficulties of, of trying to honor his wishes. Um, final thoughts, uh, you must have an appointed healthcare agent who can advocate for you. This is very important. Uh, as I said, I think we need to have ongoing counseling for these folks. It's not one and done, particularly when you only choose, when you choose option A, which I might add, most everybody has chosen option A. So, um, and bear in mind that your healthcare agent doesn't have to be a member of your family, yeah. and yeah. maybe it shouldn't be. Yeah. Depends on your family, a really close friend, somebody you've known since childhood, or someone who you've shared important life experiences with might be a better choice. So we want to hear from you. We want we want your feedback. We want your questions. 
And for those who are scholars or academics or whatever in the room, what happened to our, there's right there. our references. <laughs> so this is all online, right? This will be all online in the next couple of days. Are you absolutely gobsmacked? <laughs> 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 so, let's, so let's address your questions. What can we do for you? Yes. Let's say the director goes through everybody knows what you want if this happens to you, mm -hmm. and then the time comes and you counter what you just said and just signed. What takes precedence? That's a very good question. Very important question, and it goes to repeat yeah, the question. I'm going to. Yes. And it goes to one of the case studies that Judy presented. Um, this notion that people change their minds. It's important to recognize that people can and do change their minds. But when you change your mind or someone asserts or concludes that you've changed your mind at a point in time when you don't have decision-making capacity, that is, you don't understand what it means to change your mind, that's not changing your mind. So the case that Judy talked about where the judge said, oh, patient opened their mouth when somebody shoved a spoon against their lips, that is a sign that the patient changed their mind. Well, that's impossible, because you can only change your mind if you are of sound mind. That is, if you have decision-making capacity. And if you have decision-making capacity, then you don't need a surrogate. So the notion that someone, by some physiologic response, is demonstrating that they've changed their mind in a capacitated manner is just inherently false. And the other thing is, if you get to a stage of advanced dementia, you can't even sling three words together. Right. You know? Yeah. My That's mother, it. for example, is at the point where she can start a sentence. I haven't seen her finish a sentence in years. Because she gets halfway through and she either forgets what the rest of what she wanted to say was, or she forgets that she was even saying something. I'm not sure. Yep, question? Um, No. So the question is, does, yes. The question, actually both. And, and there's something in my slides about that. Because the health department, so the question was, does your agent's expression of a choice supersede my preferred choice of words? Um, what was in your advanced directive, the written document? or your expression of your values and preferences. And it's no on both legal and moral grounds because as the guidelines from the health department said, if the healthcare agent isn't following the specific instructions you left behind, they violated their fiduciary duty to you because their obligation is to, in the first instance, make decisions based on prior expressed wishes, like an advanced directive. In the second instance, to make decisions on the basis of what we call substituted judgment, which is sort of projecting forward what we know about your values in a situation that was anticipated onto a set of circumstances that were not quite anticipated. And third and finally, if those two techniques fail, then your agent is permitted to make decisions on the basis of what they think is in your best interest. So it is very clear as both a moral proposition and as the law in New York dictates that an agent is obligated to follow the patient's expressed wishes and it's part of what we do in medical ethics to try to mediate differences of opinion between what a patient said in writing and what an agent does at the time the patient is incapacitated. Let me tell you about I the clinical reality. Well, yeah, I think I know about it. And I, just, I think I asked the question. I didn't ask the question as clearly as. So try again. I should have. I didn't mean the agent saying they wrote this, but I think this. 
Right. And then the agent saying, you know, in many cases, every single detail is anticipated. I talked to them last week. Right. A real case of someone the mm -hmm. night, you know, the night before coming back to the hospital and having a discussion. It was only to sort of talk about that to emphasize uh, the importance of the choosing of the agent. Yes. And staying in conversation with them yeah. because there's yeah. no way we can yeah. predict that right. possible. And let me tell you what happens in clinical reality as a, as a nurse at the bedside. It doesn't, sorry about this, it doesn't matter what's written down. If you've got a family that's in conflict, doesn't matter who the agent is, if somebody else is saying, oh no, she never wanted that, she doesn't want to have this done, I'll tell you what the physician is going to say, okay, you guys go sort it out, and when you come to a, co a conclusion that you're all happy with, you come back and tell me. Now, if you're smart, you say, let's call an ethics consult, mm -hmm. and that would be helpful, because um, often people bring their own baggage and they're, they've lost sight of the person in the bed, you know, who's mom. But it, in that case, it almost doesn't matter, because everybody is so risk-averse and nobody wants to get sued. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that does happen. And as the court said in the Bornstein case, if there's lack of clarity about what the patient's wishes are, the court's always going to, and clinicians for the most part are always going to err on the side of life That's right. to give us an opportunity to sort out what is known, what is conjecture, and what is emotion yeah. speaking. Yeah. Somebody else now, yes. Yep. Now everything like differs from one state to another. Mm -hmm. So if you live half your life in New York and half your life in New Jersey and all of your New York papers are in order, but you're in some terrible accident and you end up at a hospital in New Jersey, then, I mean, is, well, then all of this good stuff that you've prepared is not gonna... No, it'll still work, right? Maybe if not the dementia directive. Well, <laughs> it won't be as easy because you're not sort of following the defined process, but the notion that a clinician is expected to follow a patient's wishes and instructions, that's a national standard. There's something called the Patient Self-Determination Act that makes that the law in all 50 states. Doesn't mean you're not gonna run into obstacles, but you're probably gonna run into some of those same obstacles even in your home state. And states tend to honor other, pe other states' advanced directives, mm -hmm. even if they're not drafted in their state. So yep. I wouldn't worry about that. Question? Yes, sir. Oh, it's, it's where are we going? W like two more questions, and then we're very late here. Yeah, we're late. Yeah. You, but you, as a nurse, what phase of Alzheimer's do you think people can no longer change their mind? You mean when do they lose decision-making capacity? For health care issues. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know how to answer that in a generic sense. Uh, I would say it depends on the person. It depends on who they are, and um, certainly by the time you get into those moderate to severe stages, you know, by the end of stage five and into stage six, you're not going to be able to remember what the hell you decided yesterday. You're not right. going to be able to remember what's important to you. It'll be of the moment, perhaps. So stage one, you can create uh, it, but oh. what point in time can you not change it? Anymore? So it, there's, not, there's not a point on the FAST scale that says now you have lost decision-making yeah. capacity. That's a separate analysis. It's something that we can talk about. Um, I'm going to suggest that we wrap up, yeah. uh, but we will stick around to answer all your questions. Uh, Judy and I take this responsibility very seriously. I want to thank you all for coming, and I appreciate your concern, and I impose upon you to please spread the word. Thank you. Yeah.